This is an afternoon session of the Right to Energy Forum. Para compartir los subtítulos. Mobilize around housing, Inglés. health, Perfecto. and decarbonization. And we will have a nice um, set of panelists from different countries of Europe. And we will discuss the different aspects of um, unfit housing, negative health impacts, and how we can overcome those with different kind of measures. And um, I will present um, the panelists in the order of their uh, contributions. So before a new contribution, I will shortly introduce um, each participant. And um, after their contributions, we are going to have a question and answer session for a discussion among panelists on relevant aspects of what has been said. And um, first, I would like to ask uh, Sarah Kupchu from um, Fondation Abbé Pierre um, to talk about unfit housing. And Sarah has a master's degree in international law from the University of Paris 1, La Sorbonne. And she has been engaged since a long time ago in the French nonprofit sector for the right, of right to housing. And she joined uh, Fondation Abbé Pierre in 2009, where she worked as a lawyer in charge of litigation strategy in Paris. During the last five years, she has been in charge of Europe, and <laughs> of Europe in uh, the research department, and she has supervised the production of the annual report of overview on housing exclusion in Europe and in partnership with FEANSA. And really shortly, I'm working at FEANSA, a partner organization of Fondation Abbé Pierre as an energy poverty officer. So I'm really happy to uh, introduce Sarah and ask her to tell key findings of her research work. Thank you, Anna, and thank you for having me today. Um, first of all, I just want to present uh, really shortly ABP Foundation because I'm not sure that everybody knows it. Um, this is a, um, uh, so ABP Foundation is a foundation, but it's also um, a civil society organization in France, really well known, and we are working exclusively on housing exclusion and access to housing for the most vulnerable people. Uh, we work in a large scale. It means that we work on homelessness until um, energy poverty and unfit housing, um, uh, prevention of eviction, and so on. So uh, today I will speak about unfit housing in Europe. Um, according to Eurostat, in 2021, uh, housing deprivation affected 4.3% uh, uh, of the total uh, European population and 9.9% uh, of poor households and costed uh, 194 billion euros per year, according, according to a, a refund. So, unfit housing is very present in the whole centers of large cities, uh, neglected it for a long time, uh, but also affect uh, the rest of the countries, um, sometimes uh, in an invisible way. peri urban areas, old towns, villages, and remote rural areas, for example. And this phenomenon is largely the result of a persistent housing crisis which uh, through the lack of housing accessible to poor households and the rent increase in the decent private sector produce disastrous effects that I will, I will speak about now. So first, um, it fits a very poor quality rental submarkets in which for lack of solutions, households are housed in conditions that are dangerous for their health, but also for their safety that uh, I think that we, the, the next uh, speakers will talk about that. Uh, so we can find some premises unfit for habitation that were as, are occupied by uh, people like cellars or garages, 
there are some divided houses, but also, for example, micro housing in, in Paris, for example, we have a lot of people living in really, really little room under the roof uh, of the buildings, like five meter quarter. Um, and that situation offer windfall effects for certain unscrupulous owners. Very often, households are neither the strength, nor the reflex, nor even the contracts to denounce this situation. So the, this crisis also pushes some households to seek security and stability in existing property. But for the most vulnerable ones, becoming a homeowner sometimes lead to a cruel impasse because they buy a cheap home in a damaged co-ownership and then they discover the burden of charges and work uh, to be carried out um, or because they buy a home in a rural uh, area to be renovated. And then uh, they see the project compromised by the first difficulty. They find themselves in debt and they feel really trapped in an unavoidable, sorry, housing, uh, sometimes with, with children. Unfit housing also is a manifestation of poverty and social isolation. This is the case, for example, of many retired people in rural areas uh, who have been living in difficult and dangerous conditions for a long time and never call for help because they are used to live in that kind of home and they don't know who to contact and they don't even thought about that. And it also it is also the manifestation of discrimination. Uh, the most uh, the people most affected by unfit housing are also those who cannot access the good quality market because of their sexual orientation, their origins, or their age. We know that, for example, um, there is a lot of people living in the deprived uh, housing uh, from uh, with a migration background or uh, for women or for people um, uh, very young. Uh, so actions to tackle this different manifestation of substandard housing um, are mainly under targeted for the moment. Uh, we need clear plans to tackle substandard housing at local and European level. Uh, but these plans will only work with a real and broad commitment from the member states. But what is actually happening on the ground today? What is the reality of the mobilization? Um, actually, we have little visibility on this. And uh, too many countries have not set, set up policies to combat substandard housing. And too many households are still waiting for help from the public authorities. Uh, coercive procedures. Uh, don't exist or are not initiated or not followed and the justice system still struggles to effectively prosecute and condemn those who are take advantage of the housing crisis to enrich themselves at the expense of vulnerable people. Furthermore, the support of occupants is crucial as no solution can uh, can succeed without the tenant or owner who live in being informed, reassured, convinced, and supported over time. Uh, but this support is seriously underfunded, and uh, we can see that the legal support for tenants, for example, is not sufficient to enable them to know and defend their rights. So, uh, about EU policies, the Fit for 55 is not ambitious enough to take into account this reality. The renovation wave must take this extreme situation with it and provide for the protection of the victims of this type of housing, which is dangerous for the safety and health of its occupants. ABEPA Foundation, therefore, ask uh, European Union to push member states into the framework of the renovation wave to commit without delay ambitious plans to combat substandard housing with a real programmatic will by setting quantitative and qualitative targets with obligations to achieve results on those buildings for identifications. That is a real problem in Europe because of the lack of data, for the financing uh, of work, and for the support of households to avoid them becoming discouraged when faced the complexity of that situation. By using coercive procedure against rude landlords, by reinforcing measures to encourage owners to carry 
a career to work, uh, particularly through financial aid, of course, but also to oblige them to do so, or even to do it in their place if necessary by substitutions when the situation is in an emergency. This is the case in France, by the way, even if it's complicated to implement. Finally, I have to say that uh, we must act on all housing policy chain so that substandard housing is no longer a refuge for households that have not been able to find decent housing as well. The battle against uh, substandard housing can only be won when the housing crisis will be stopped by implementing all the measures that Association and Fondation Abbe Pierre have been advocating for years, many production of affordable and well-located housing, rent control intense uh, areas, increased subsidies, implementation of housing force policy, intensification of uh, prevention of rental uh, evictions. So together with Fianza, we will explore all these issues and even more in the next uh, overview on housing exclusion in Europe, uh, which will be presented to you in June and will focus on substandard, substandard housing in Europe. Yeah, so stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, for this um, very impressive um, opening speech. And you touched really important areas of and different forms of unfit housing. And you listed a set of uh, places that should really be implemented as soon as possible. We will discuss um, more in detail the relevant policies at the second half of um, our panel. Uh, and now I would like uh, to give the floor to Daniel that will um, present to us how energy poverty, a form of or um, a consequence of unfit housing, can impact uh, the health of um, occupants. Um, Daniel is uh, working for the National Energy Action as a se senior research and policy officer. And she's also a trustee and founder of the Fuel Poverty Research Network. In recent years, um, she has been working on mostly on the topic of lived experiences of fuel poverty among at-risk groups, considering key factors such as tenure, householders' age, and rurality. And she is also really interested in the design of uh, and implementation of energy-related advice and support. And she also holds a number of related external positions to fuel poverty, such as trustee of the Essential Services and Access Network. And she was an academic advisor to the International Energy Agency's Task 24 on engaging hard to research to reach energy users. So I give the floor to you to present on the health impacts of energy poverty. Thanks, Anna. It's really great to um, to come and speak today and, and to, to see you again after, after quite a while. I'm going to attempt to share some slides, so I'll um, I'll wait for a nod um, and hopefully meaning that that's all in place. Fab. Uh, that's working. Fantastic. Um, yes, as I said, thanks ever so much for, for having me come and speak today. Uh, my name is Danielle, uh, Senior Research and Policy Officer over at National Energy Action. Um, we are a national fuel poverty charity um, working across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And we work closely with our sister charity, Energy Action Scotland, up in Scotland. So we cover the Great Britain and Northern Ireland context. Um, we are a charity that campaigns um, and has a policy and research team. We advocate uh, with strong practical and community development teams. Um, our vision is to end fuel poverty or energy poverty, I guess, in, in a more broader European context. Um, and through that mission to ensure that everyone in the UK can afford to meet their energy needs in the home, sufficient for good health, comfort and well-being. Um, so we understand and, and, and consider fuel poverty as a, a toxic cocktail, three factors um, that are sort of commonly cited in the literature to, to uh, produce a situation in which a household is living in fuel poverty, a combination of high energy costs, poor energy efficiency and low household income. Um, but we also recognise and explore and advocate on behalf of, of a range of other situational factors that shape and modify um, a risk for somebody living in fuel poverty and how it's experienced um, on the ground. So really bringing forward that lived experience in, in the work that we do. 
We are um, not the only country living through and experiencing an energy crisis, but it very much is an unprecedented crisis and is driving um, and closely linked with the cost of living crisis uh, to sort of uh, uh, display some of that, uh, sort of the extremes of that uh, last October or October 2021, actually now. And we estimated there were four and a half million in the UK households living in fuel poverty, um, and that rose to 6.7 million and sort of one in 10 households. Um, and come April, um, April 1st in the UK, when our price cap protections change again, we expect there to be 8.4 million households living in fuel poverty. Now, these are big numbers and they feel quite skewed, but um, uh, in bill terms, in householder bill terms, that's shot from sort of £1,100 up to um, projected um, estimates of £3,000. And that's with government protections in, in place. Um, so really unaffordable at the household level. Uh, the impacts of fuel poverty, so a couple of slides just to outline the broader impacts before I focus in on the health impacts of fuel poverty. Um, so based, uh, as I mentioned, on latest statistics, um, over 4 million in, in fuel poverty, rising to 8 um, with the uh, projected rises into April. That's 1.4 million families with dependent children. Um, and we do experience country and regional variations. So I think Anna mentioned in, in the intro about rurality, and that's one, one particular area in which we understand vulnerability being exacerbated. Um, we put it uh, with the estimates of the rises in April, we put the rise to be between a fifth and a quarter of all households. This is a huge scale, the problem that we're facing now. Um, and as a charity, we're calling for urgent action for all fuel poor households. Um, and a little bit of the focus today will be around um, one of the significant impacts on this around um, uh, the way in which this impacts our National Health Service and, and other health al alliance services um, that, that Cold Homes has driving hospital admissions. Um, with an annual estimated cost to our National Health Service of around £2 billion per year. But there are a range of other impacts um, from, from living in a cold home or experiencing fuel or energy poverty. Uh, they prevent people from thriving and they are known to adopt sometimes harmful coping strategies and we're seeing evidence of this more and more. Uh, going to bed early, for example, curtailing social interaction, not hanging out with family and friends. Underheating the home is a common strategy, often only one room, cutting back on electricity and other forms of utility services. Uh, spending time in public buildings. So in the UK, we've seen a huge rise in warmth banks and warmth hubs and um, public buildings like libraries, even A&E waiting rooms where people are um, sitting out to keep warm. Uh, cooking and heating using unsafe service or inappropriate appliances. So we're hearing more and more evidence of people burning um, various household items um, in order to keep warm using barbecues to cook food indoors and all of this coming with the huge risks to safety um, as well as cutting back on other essentials such as food clothing toiletries and, and other essential elements of, of uh, a safe warm and well life um, eating only cold meals and and using food banks and then also lots and lots of uh, examples of formal and informal borrowing and rising debt um, as has been demonstrated by some of our research and the research of partners that we work closely with as well to bring the focus on to, to health, um, uh, as was the invitation for this uh, speech today, at NEA we do a lot of work uh, with health partners to demonstrate the evidence around the link between uh, cold homes and health. So while it's difficult in many cases with many health conditions to establish that direct causal pathway, um, the evidence makes clear that the relationship between cold homes and health exists. And I want to run through some of those examples in, in the remaining slides and time that I have with you. So we estimate that there are 3.6 million people in the UK with a medical condition um, or living with a disability in fuel poverty from April. And this is roughly with uh, 6 million of those um, living in uh, low income, financially vulnerable and 1.8 million carers. So the impact in terms of health is not just on those experiencing the health conditions, um, but wider field on those that are responsible for caring for them. Um, the most common statistic around health and the, the most extreme impact relates to excess winter deaths in the UK, excess winter deaths and morbidity. Um, and the most recent statistics released in January um, uh, calculated that around 4,000 people in England and Wales died last winter from living in a cold home. Cold and damp housing conditions uh, impact not just on uh, mortality, but also on morbidity, so the experience of health conditions. Um, and uh, in the UK, the, the, um, the link is specifically to the standard of the properties. So countries with harsher winters and lower outdoor temperatures than the UK experience fewer excess winter deaths and have lower rates of excess winter morbidity, um, especially in relation to respiratory conditions. 
and um, therefore the link to between poor health and um, the thermal efficiency of the property um, demonstrates that the poor thermal standards in the UK play, play a, a key role. Some of the key ways in which the health impacts of living in fuel poverty and cold homes are experienced are through a number of um, collections of conditions, um, which are sort of widely evidenced. Um, respiratory disease in cold homes um, predominantly. So living in a cold and damp home has been shown to be strongly associated with the experience of various types of respiratory disease, um, particularly among children and the elderly. Um, with each one degree Celsius drop in temperature below five degrees, GP consultations for respiratory illness in older people is, has been shown to increase by uh, 19%. Hospital admissions for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, are four, more, are four times more likely to happen over the winter. And homes that have damp or mold are linked to a 30 to 50% increase in respiratory problems, and particularly among children suffering from asthma and bronchitis, um, where there's a 32% greater risk of, of experiencing wheezing illness um, and a 90% greater risk of suffering from breathing problems at night. In terms of cardiovascular conditions, the evidence base suggests that living in a warm home that's heated to recommended temperatures um, may mitigate um, somebody's susceptibility to suffering from various types of cardiovascular disease. Um, and the evidence base uh, um, demonstrates that it's estimated, sorry, that 9% of hypertension in Scotland, for example, could be prevented by maintaining um, standard indoor temperatures above 18 degrees, so the recommended warmth temperature. Mental health and well-being is also another key area in terms of the health impacts on, on uh, from those living in cold homes and fuel poverty. Um, and we know um, um, among a range of conditions, so living in cold and poor quality housing has been linked to persistent worries about affordability, concerns about physical health, higher levels of depression, worry and chronic thermal discomfort. Uh, research by Natsen found that 10% of people suffering from a common mental disorder were not able to keep their homes warm enough during the winter. Children and young people have been evidenced extensively throughout research um, are especially at risk. So more than one in four adolescents in cold housing are at risk of multiple mental health problems compared to one in 20 of their peers living in warm housing. Um, and parents living in fuel poverty are between one and 1.5 and 1.8 times more likely to develop depression than parents who live in a warm home. Um, poor quality cold housing has also been linked to several negative mental health consequences for children, such, such as stigmatization, social isolation, and feelings of helplessness, which can negatively impact on edu educational attainment and social mobility. And we also know that people with mental health issues have significant um, challenges in accessing support, um, particularly um, through research that's looked at engaging uh, with suppliers um, and networks. So what are some of the solutions? So over the last decade, um, we can see that progress has been made on fuel poverty with it reducing um, from the start of the decade and uh, to around 13% in 2019. But the energy and the cost of living crisis has very quickly undone a lot of this good work. Fuel poverty is estimated to be roughly back to around a fifth to a quarter and further fuel price rises on the way in autumn in the UK when the price cap rises um, will have detrimental impacts on, on those um, uh, who are most vulnerable. Um, so the picture is unfortunately not a positive one for the fuel poor and for those who may have never struggled before, so newly vulnerable. Um, uh, that are now faced with energy bills and cost of living far beyond their reach. So there is more to do to support those still struggling to heat and power their homes to an adequate and healthy level. And some of these solutions are set out on the last slide here. So considering what we know about fuel poverty, the risk factors, its prevalence, socio-technical nature, um, we ask ourselves what we can do about it and what we campaign and advocate for at National Energy Action. So the most widely accepted solution and one accepted as the most sustainable is improving energy efficiency. The cheapest unit of energy is that which we do not use. So if we can reduce energy demand, then we reduce costs um, and we have a positive impact on the health and well-being of, of the people living in homes that are, are changed. Um, and not only reduces costs, it also increases comfort and reduces carbon. So examples of policy measures to do this include our current eco scheme, and I'd be happy to share more details and talk about this, and uh, the Hug Local Authority Delivery Scheme. Again, I'm happy to, to talk about these particular schemes. Um, advances in technologies and technical solutions are also vital, and in particular their application and inclusion for in a fair and meaningful way to fuel poor households, um, to ensure that there is fair distribution of benefits in the low carbon transition. 
Increasing incomes is essential across the board with key roles for income maximisation services such as welfare checks and benefit entitlement checks um, and is also ensuring increment su supplements um, where they exist, so accessing some of that support. Um, lastly, support with energy costs um, through mechanisms in the UK like the warm home discount. So we are calling for this to be broadened and extended um, and announced to made last year um, to bring this forward. Um, we're calling for a rethink on the new policy of heat now, I pay later. So where £200 bills will be paid at a later date and we'll see um, further action around this as, as time goes on. Uh, essentially, there is an urgent need to bring forward the scale of investment pledged by government for fuel po poverty and energy efficiency programmes um, and to, as we kind of uh, routinely say in things like this, to kickstart the energy efficiency improvements in the home of the fuel poor at scale and at pace. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me come and speak today. I also just wanted to um, make uh, those aware that we at NEA also run a number of training schemes um, and programmes with that's uh, one specifically focusing on um, health impacts of fuel poverty. And uh, as with many of the sort of policy notes within the presentation, I'd be happy to talk to uh, anybody interested in finding out more about the training also. So thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, for your really um, meaningful presentation with a lot of information on how uh, fuel poverty impacts negatively household health and also for highlighting um, the different um, policy solutions that can help that. A few years ago, I participated at one of the conferences of the National Energy Action, where someone highlighted that it's really sad that doctors cure uh, people with respiratory diseases and then they send back to their homes where they get sick again because of their bad housing condition. And this, uh, this has remained in my mind since then. And um, after your um, introduction to um, the relation of health and energy poverty, I would like to give the floor to Christina Prikop from um, EPHA. Uh, the European Public Health Alliance. Um, she will talk about a uh, more specific health aspect of um, heating and especially, um, which is which can also be assumed as a specific um, aspect of um, energy poverty, which is how heating impacts negatively household health. And I will be especially interested in your presentation as I've been working a lot on um, the situation of uh, fuel wood users, and um, which is still um, uh, the main heating method of many low-income households in Central and Eastern Europe. So I will be really interested in your presentation. But before that, I shortly present Christina, who is a junior policy manager at the European Public Health Alliance. Uh, she works with European and national member organizations to develop policy positions, build advocacy and establish communication campaigns on air pollution. Recently, her projects have focused on the impact of residential heating and cooking on indoor and outdoor air quality. She is particularly passionate about contributing to a structural and sustainable shift away from polluting fuels and about the health and climate co-benefits that this can bring. So I think we will hear some insights from your late study on this issue. So we are really looking forward for your presentation. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Hello, everyone. I will also attempt to uh, share slides. Please let me know if this is working. Oh, if it's not working okay, rather, but um, hoping everything is all right. Um, hello, everyone. I will also do a short introduction uh, about IFA and um, our mission and vision. So we are a, a European health NGO working with national and European members who are healthcare professionals associations, but also disease and patient groups. And together we work towards a vision of a Europe with universal good health and well-being, where all have access to sustainable, high-quality health systems and healthy environments. And in order to implement that vision, one of the topics that we address is air pollution, which is known to be the single largest environmental health 
health risk in Europe, it contributes to hundreds of thousands of premature deaths every year throughout the continent. You have there the latest data from the uh, European Environment Agency. Um, but while this issue of air pollution is well established, what is unfortunately often overlooked is the contribution from the building sector, um, because in fact, more than half of fine particulate matter emissions in Europe come from energy use in buildings and uh, particularly from solid fuels burning. And um, now what is particulate matter? What is PM? This is uh, a collective term used for solid and liquid particles in the air. Um, these are small particulates uh, who, who are more dangerous as they get smaller. Um, so the, um, they can penetrate into the lungs, but also enter the bloodstream. And they uh, are linked to a number of conditions, including lung cancer. And, and you see another uh, lung list there. But this is to illustrate that um, air pollution impacts every single organ in the human body. And um, particulate matter is particularly linked to uh, solid fuels traditionally, but I also want to touch on a different pollutant, which is nitrogen dioxide, that is normally associated more with uh, gas combustion. But nowadays, uh, in trying to address the issue of particulate matter pollution, some producers are uh, working on new wood stoves uh, with higher combustion temperatures that then lead to higher nitrogen oxides emissions. So we're kind of trying to fix one issue and address it, but that creates a different issue in a different area, and that is nitrogen dioxide, um, which is now known to be uh, harmful to health at even lower rates than thought before. The World Health Organization published in 2021 an update of its air quality guidelines, and these um, showed a fourfold four decrease in the level of, um, of NO2 limits. So this is the biggest difference that we've seen for any of the pollutants included in the guidelines. Um, and this is because NO2 is linked to increased inflammation of the airways, to reduced lung function, increased asthma attacks, and so on. And it is also a precursor for ground level ozone, which is a different pollutant, and it is associated with a number of other um, harmful health conditions. And um, so we see that air pollution leads to these personal um, health burdens to increased mortality risk, to uh, uh, increased health burden, but also to societal and economic costs in terms of um, hospital admissions, in terms of lost work days, in terms of lost productivity. And we at IFA um, wanted to quantify this to have a clearer picture of the magnitude of the problem. So as Anna was mentioning, we worked with C. Delft uh, for a study that uh, showed that the health-related impacts of outdoor air pollution from domestic heating and cooking cost the EU 29 billion euros every year. And that is the equivalent of 130 euros for the average European, but we also see um, what was also mentioned uh, this disparity between Western and Eastern and Central Europe. And if we zoom in for the findings, we see wood being a major, major contributor with over 12 billion euros. Um, and that is despite the fact that in the energy mix, it does not play that big of a role, but we see it is so polluting that the health costs associated with wood burning are um, you know, close to half of, of the total costs. Um, a note here to say though, that this is not uh, to say that there are other less polluting fossil fuels. Um, it is rather to say that we should leapfrog from all of these health harmful um, combustion based fuels to uh, cleaner alternatives that have no direct emissions in people's homes. And um, the, to go to the next slide, the energy ladder here is uh, showing the correlation between income levels and uh, types of energy being used. And we see solid fuels at the bottom, uh, the, the lower half of that graph. Um, being used by low-income, very low-income and middle-income people, um, but also 
while we know that this is a correlation that exists, we lack very specific data for specific vulnerable groups, uh, which is something that my colleagues, for example, working on Roma Health are, are very aware of um, because they would need this for in order to be able to design the most effective interventions to address the issue. And um, as, as previous speakers have mentioned, there are other issues associated um, with uh, conditions where uh, vulnerable groups live, including smaller houses, poor ventilation, um, the, the, the idea that they would not necessarily be able to ventilate because they want to trap the heat in, but that also traps pollution in. Um, there's damp and mold, there's the livelihood and living in pollution hotspots, so near very busy roads or near industrial areas, in neighborhoods where all the, uh, the households would heat their homes with uh, very polluting fuels. And there's also the issue of cooking that um, IFA has been working on that is also not very uh, well known and not um, addressed as much as, sh as it should be. Um, and our recent um, work has revealed that there are um, also several hundred thousand European children who suffer from asthma symptoms that are linked uh, to cooking with gas. So this is all to show that um, this is a complex matter and it requires a number of different policy pathways to be addressed. Um, the first one is the Ambient Air Quality Directive, which is currently being revised. This is a directive that sets limit values for a number of pollutants, including uh, particulate matter and nitrogen nitrogen dioxide. Um, and part of IFA's position is that monitoring is really important for implementation um, and enforcement. And so this, uh, the monitoring stations should cover uh, communities of disadvantaged groups, and for example, be placed around social housing. Um, another file that we are uh, keeping an eye on is the eco-design for solid fuel heaters, the revision of which um, is meant to start later this year. And um, we, we are keen that this reflects health concerns and sets strict PM and NOx limits. Um, and this should be applied for all eco-design um, regulations um, in any case. And then uh, thirdly, the Renewable Energy Directive uh, for which the negotiations are ongoing. Um, we've been advocating for wood burning uh, not to be classified as a renewable energy source. It is really important that health and environmental policies work together. And so we've, we've partnered with environmental groups uh, to, to send this message that wood burning is not, uh, should not be considered renewable. Um, for energy production, and lastly, but very importantly, the allocation of funds that ensure a socially just green transition. Um, as Vice President Timmermans was saying uh, just a few days ago, the energy transition is not should not be a rich people game. This is uh, really important. Um, everyone needs to be able to live in healthy environments, and we all have a right to to healthy air in our homes and in our communities. And with that, I thank you for your attention, stop sharing, um, and hand it back to Anna, and happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you, Christina, for um, your presentation. I think from the presentation so far, it became really clear that it's not only necessary to invest in the renovation of the poorest households because they deserve help, help in renovations, but it would be beneficial for the entire society as um, the air would become cleaner and no one would suffer from the current really high um, levels of emission. And also it would globally reduce uh, health costs of countries. Therefore, it's really important to support vulnerable households to transition away from um, polluting heating methods and to insulate their homes properly and provide access um, for um, renewable energy sources. So thank you, Christina, for highlighting this um, um, important uh, fact. And now I will uh, leave the floor to Antonio Del Pio Gonzalez, who is a firefighter um, from Catalonia. And um, 
He's um, a fire surgeon for the Generalitat de Catalunya since 1995. Um, he's also a technician in occupational risk prevention, a trainer in confined fires, and he contributes to the work of the um, Catalonian Energy Poverty Alliance and the Mortgage Affected People's Platforms as well. He's a promoter of energy poverty and vulnerability protocol for firefighters in Catalonia. And he will highlight how energy poverty can lead to um, really tragic events, uh, risking uh, people's lives, not only their health situation, but also their lives. So thank you, Antonio, for, re uh, for joining us. And I uh, give the floor to you. That if you need translation from Spanish to English, uh, go to the interpretation button and uh, choose um, the English channel, and I will do the same <laughs> as I don't have a common language, unfortunately, with Antonio. Gracias, Ana. Thank you, Ana. Thank you, everyone. These wonderful little, um, presentations. My presentation is not that technical. It will be a lot more naive, but it will be practical and necessary. We are, uh, we are a union that works with social entities, the Alliance for Energy Against Energy Poverty, and the platform of uh, people affected by the, by the housing crisis in 2014. Our work as, as firefighters we saw a number of accidents with a similar, similar um, pattern. There was a dramatic incident in which four, four children died from the same family in, in, in a fire. And this caused us to, to go to, to be alert to energy poverty. The, the pattern of this, um, this accident was, was that there was a family, a migrant family, who had, um, who had due to, due to the crisis, the bank had re repossessed their, their home and they, they went to, to squat on another, their, oh, their, their own home, which they had, they had then bought. And then the, the, the bank then uh, disconnected their services. Um, and this was a this was actually a, in a, in a legal um, disconnection from their from their uh, electrical connection. This led this led to um, a, an, over, an over an overuse of, of electricity, which which then ca caused a fire, which then led to the deaths of these four children. And so, due to this, we saw this this happening in in many in many of the fires that we were seeing which led to many deaths. And we started to do a study. This was the only study that has been done in Spain to try to, to associate these deaths with uh, energy poverty and vulnerability. This, this study that we did in the first trimester from 2014, showed that out of the 10 mortal victims in, in these households, which we found, seven of them, 70% were directly related to energy poverty. That is to say, either they had been families who, because of uh, disconnections, and because of having um, having been uh, uh, connected illegally to the electrical electrical network, either were died due to electrocutions or to fire, or using other methods to to try to heat themselves using um, using embers or, or using fire to to heat their their to even warm up their food. These types of uh, these types of patterns that we saw. And also in in occupied dwellings, um, this was 
was sort of a cruel and, and horrible situation that we kept seeing in this, in this crisis. From, from this, this study, there was a, there was a video that I, I want to show you. And I'll, later on, I'll, I'll stick it in the drive. In this, in this video, the first thing that I want to share is this is, this is a problem that was not really being detected or identified and the society was not aware of it. So we wanted, we wanted to first make a video that will sort of like put this out in the public knowledge so that people would understand what the problem was and then, and then begin to prevent this issue. So the first thing we did was we we had a bunch of um, we had a bunch of firefighters explain their own experience in these in these fires and incidents, um, children who died, and old old people who had died as well, and um, all of these situations that then showed that there was a, a pattern of energy poverty in these incidents. When this video came came to the public's attention, we were working with um, with a legislative initiative, a proposition um, having to do with the, the evictions, which was in favor of to to solve energy energy poverty and also um, eviction issues. This popular proposition was. Um, then went to the Supreme Court, and the and this 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 lake came out in 2015, and then we still have not not found that the because of the Supreme Court's decision, this is still doesn't give any protection or doesn't give full protection to to vulnerable people. We still have 60 16 percent of the population of fam families that that are, um, suffer from cold, and and 13 percent of the families which can't pay their, their energy bills. And the, although this lay guaranteed them a um, social um, a social bono, they still, um, there's still a, a, a very large proportion of our population that doesn't have access to this uh, bono social. Together with these guarantees that the lay offered, that the law offered, the, the ener energy, this, this, anyway, this led to 20, 20 million um, people being helped. And the, oh, I'm sorry, 20 million euros in, in aid to the, to the families and and the the energy the energy companies had to pay this this out, but even even despite this, the 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 energy comp the two principal energy companies um, in 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 Spain have have, have gotten sixteen thousand million sixteen billion in in profit. So. This protocol, um, having to do with the with the firefighters, tried 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 to get get um, the the firefighters to to um, create statistics around around what was going on. They tend to be the first people who arrive. They see they see exactly what happens. They are the first people to arrive on scene and 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 can take take some basic uh, data. And if I'm going if I'm going too fast. The traductor will will tell me. Translator will tell me. Um, and so the the indicators that we were using, these these uh, the state of the so that they were they were looking at the structural state, um, presence of wh whether they had basic services like electricity or and if and if they were. They were like stealing the electricity, or whether it was they were connected, or whether they were paying. Another another relation was whether these people had connections with families, whether they were they were um, receiving help from from social services and all of this. All of this data was then aggregated. 
And this helping to identify these problems and give, give, give some numbers to these problems then helped us to have some data about energy poverty in Catalonia. And then this, this was the first step so that we could then, then begin to fight it at a political level. And this would also help us to identify um, to the social services that there are people in, in vulnerable situations. In 2016, we signed the, the protocol for energy poverty. This, this didn't get applied and it's still waiting to get applied. And also the, the problem of um, Settlement. migrants who are coming in because, because of a cruel law about um, immigration are basically uh, without, without any place to live and they wind up uh, basically setting up, setting up shanty towns or, or, or just uh, terrible, terrible living situations. And this creates a lot of uh, flammable uh, accumulation and there's bad electrical installations. There's no there's no emergency exits. There are very crowded situations. <laughs> All of this creates large um, danger dangers of, of fire, like what happened recently in in a in an industrial uh, factory which affected 300 people and four people died recently. Neither the law, which guarantees about the guarantees gives gives guarantees to um, to people's housing problems or the problems around um, around energy poverty, are are really being put into into play, and and there's not really even any any statistics that can show that this is related to energy poverty. So thank you very much, and um, I'll I'll be available for more questions in the in the roundtable discussions. Um, thank you, Antonio, for this uh, moving and still inspiring um, contribution. It was really really shocking to hear the cases and inspiring to see all the work that you have done and also the partial success in the legislation because this is really important to achieve and hopefully once um, the government will understand how important it is to protect everyone from despite their housing or legal situation to be safe from um, these terrible cases. So thank you so much and uh, good luck for your uh, future work and thanks for doing this. And now I will uh, give the floor to uh, Olivier Tissot, who is working on uh, a topic connected to, to what Antonio has been talking about, but mostly on the policy level. So Olivier Tissot is working for uh, EADS, um, which is the Forum for uh, European Electric uh, Domestic Safety. And he worked there for um, um, in the secretariat <clears throat> since a long time. And um, this forum is also uh, organized by the European Copper Institute and gathering fire safety professionals, consumer associations, the electrical installation value chains and other organizations. And it aims to improve electrical safety of dwellings um, in Europe, and before that, he already gained 15 years of electric safety experience, professional experience in France. So I give the floor to you um, to discuss how electric safety can improve the situation of energy poor households. Um, thank you for the introduction, Anna. And, uh... Thank you also for inviting uh, Fids uh, to this uh, great session. Um, so I would like first to bounce um, on the previous uh, presentation from Antonio. Um, we know um, at Fids that um, fire from electrical source 
are a predominant uh, cause of domestic fires in Europe. Uh, 25 to 30 percent of domestic fires have indeed uh, an electrical source. And a proven measure uh, to address this fire is to deploy um, inspection regimes. Um, but I would like to start uh, this presentation with another uh, number. Um, FIDS estimates that in Europe, uh, 132 million of electrical installation are obsolete. And um, this represents uh, half of the building stock. And it is where vulnerable communities are potentially living. And beyond this uh, observation, we wanted to know if more generally, people affected by energy poverty are more exposed to the fire risk than the rest of the population. And in fact, when we ask this question around us, most of the people answer, yes, there is a link. But when we look for uh, documentation, literature, uh, papers, uh, we saw that uh, there was uh, no much, uh, not that much uh, information available. So really the answer needs uh, more evidence. It's why uh, last year we started a survey uh, trying to answer this question. And we asked 10 questions to key stakeholders uh, through an online survey, uh, which was running for three months. And we received uh, 27 responses covering co-covering uh, 13 countries. And we think uh, that it is uh, representative. Um, the first questions we asked was really uh, straightforward. Do you think that people affected by energy poverty are more exposed to fire risk than the rest of the population? And with no surprise, 95% of the respondents, of the re respondents uh, answered Yes. So uh, we try to get a little bit further into the topic and um, uh, to address uh, fire safety, um, there are mainly uh, technical measures. And um, technical measures are related to renovation. And the question was, when renovation starts to tackle energy poverty, are fire prevention uh, measures included? 67% of responders answer occasionally, 15% no, and 18% yes. And according to the previous question, 95% consider that people affected by energy poverty are more exposed uh, to fire risk than the rest of the population. And here, we have 15% of respondents who said no. And this means that 10% of respondents are aware of the situation, but they are not able to manage the risk. There are uh, several reasons uh, for this uh, state of fact. Uh, no budget available, no regulation, lack of information, or not in the scope of the respondent. 18% um, of the respondents uh, said yes, and uh, this is encouraging and uh, showing that some initiatives are systematically addressing energy poverty and fire risk simultaneously. Um, there is here an opportunity to collect and share uh, best practices. Now, when we ask uh, which kind of prevention measure are included. Um, the people who answer um, occasionally and yes, uh, uh, gave us these um, answers. Smoke alarm, uh, 47%. Electrical installation upgrade, 43%. Electrical safety check, 43%. Guys, gas safety check. 52% evacuation plan, 10% sprinkler, 4%. Um, 
Um, I would like to comment a little bit on these uh, figures. A reasonable number uh, of replies included the gas safety check, so 52%. And this funding should be related to the fact that this check is mandatory in the large number of European countries. Uh, contrary, the number reached for smoke alarm, 47%, is rather low if we consider that this measure is already mandatory in some um, countries in uh, the European Union. And let's dig a little bit more on uh, electrical safety. The replies regarding the inspection of electrical installation, 43% and their upgrade, 43% are interesting because 100% of respondents have answering yes to electrical safety check, have replied yes to electrical installation upgrade. This means that people active in the field know by experience that after an inspection of an electrical installation, an upgrade is systematically necessary for people living in poor condition. But this means also that 57% of respondents um, uh, for yes, for 57% um, of respondents, the renovations aiming to address energy poverty do not include a check or an upgrade of the electrical installation. This means that renovations aiming to alleviate energy poverty may leave occupants uh, with potentially unsafe uh, electrical installation. There was many more questions. Uh, but um, I would like to enter a little bit more into the analysis now. Um, these figures are globally encouraging, but they are not sufficient. And uh, really the concern is about occasionally, 67% uh, of respondents. Occasionally is a little bit like lottery. Does it mean that after renovation by a trusted org association, the citizen has no guarantee regarding the safety? Okay, the question is really on the table. Um, uh, we know all that uh, building renovation is uh, certainly the best structural measure to address energy poverty, um, but a more a systematic consideration of the fire risk should be encouraged to offer safe and decent housing. And just um, to comment a little bit on this, um, the electrical safety is already included into the definition of decent housing uh, in France. Um, the survey, interestingly, received a lot of comments uh, demonstrating that uh, the interest from the respondent into the topic uh, was very high. I just want to put some quotes there. Uh, prevention is key, um, is key, sorry. Uh, there is a need for information, awareness, education, um, the importance of local authorities as key actors has been underlined. Renovation has to include energy, fire, electricity, and gas as a wall. Uh, ban energy, energy disconnection. Um, energy disconnection have already been discussed um, on Tuesday during a panel session, a very inter interesting one. Um, there is a need for uh, the education of the professional in the field of energy poverty, key importance of financial support, no need to explain, uh, the importance of fire brigades, thank you very much Antonio, um, um, the necessary deep renovation, holistic renovation, uh, and better regulation. These are only few comments and you can read all the comments uh, in the reports. I will uh, give you uh, after um, the, the, the way to, to access this report. Um, as conclusions, um, the link between fire safety and energy poverty is uh, fully supported. And uh, this is what we define as the double penalty. Uh, people in energy poverty situation are uh, more uh, at fire risk. And um, fire um, fighters, fire officers uh, used to say that fire discriminates. And indeed, a more consistent approach to integrate fire safety consideration into initiatives addressing energy poverty and energy efficiency is required. 
And um, last but not least, the question of data. Data should be collated in a harmonized model at uh, EU level. And uh, we think that the energy poverty advisory hub um, is maybe a good uh, tool to, to, to do this. Um, about best practices, um, fire safety measure must be included in the energy poverty advisory hub as well. Um, the basics of the management of fire, like smoke alarm or evacuation plan, need to be strongly promoted. Um, we ask for free gas and electrical checks before all renovation, and they should be mandatory. And gas and electrical upgrades uh, should be integrated into energy renovation support, both financially and technically. Um, to conclude, um, uh, I would say that this study uh, is for us uh, only a beginning, uh, like uh, an awareness, and we hope uh, that it will uh, trigger more substantial work. Um, and recently, we have been happy to learn that Professor um, Stefan Buzarowski uh, from the University of Manchester has released a PhD project titled uh, Fire Safety and Energy Poverty, Tackling a Hidden Injustice. So we hope that we will, uh, we will have more of this uh, study in the future. And um, I encourage you to uh, read our full report, which is available on our website. Um, I'm ready to answer all your questions. And once again, I um, thank uh, the organizer for uh, inviting uh, Fitz and to talk about this study. Thank you, Olivier, for your presentation and highlighting really relevant aspects that are sadly not really uh, discussed uh, in the larger energy poverty discussion so far, but that will change. And, and um, it's, uh, I think it's really crucial that households not only get access to funding for renovate their homes, but to technical assistance that include also information on electrical safety, because not only low income households lack this information, but I think a large part of the society, especially landlords that might rent their homes to low income households as well. So thank you for your important advocacy work. And now, um, I will give the floor to Basim Nebiu, who is um, working at Habitat uh, for Humanity International. And he's the director for Central and Eastern Europe, Commonwealth of Independent States at Habitat, uh, based out of Habitat uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa area office in Bratislava for many years. He has led the work of Habitat um, on residential energy in Eastern Europe and managed the residential energy efficiency program and initiative, including the RELY program. Uh, he has a BA and MA in economy and 15 years of experience managing social housing, shelter and residential energy programs in Eastern Europe, Western Balkans and Central Asia in his current role. He leads the Habitat team that organized the European Housing Forum in 2021. And he will talk to us uh, about how um, key obstacles of renovating in Central Eastern Europe, where energy poverty rates are higher and renovation programs are uh, scarce, uh, can be. So, how these issues can be overcome through. Um, interventions in the residential sector. So the floor is yours, Basim, and thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, first of all, um, compliments to Feanza for uh, creating this lineup of uh, speakers. I think it was, um, for me, very inspiring and thought-provoking to hear Sarah, Daniel, Christine, uh, Antonio, and Olivier sort of um, unpacking various causes, but also manifestations of uh, energy poverty uh, and sort of making my job here much, much easier uh, in terms of uh, uh, my presentation, because I don't, I feel I don't need to make any case. 
uh, not only one, but I think four or five cases have been made and they're all equally relevant and, uh, and necessary. Uh, I do have some slides, I will not go through them, uh, but so, so Anna, if you can just have them flow through the, uh, through the presentation uh, and I'll try to, in the interest of time, we, to give back some time. Uh, in this course, just a little bit about Habitat. Habitat for Humanity is a global housing and shelter organization, uh, which was started in 1976 in the United States, but it's been out for a long time in Europe, uh, actually for about quarter century since the beginning of 90s. And um, it's about, uh, uh, Basically, it's, it's a people-centered organization. So we all we care about housing from the perspective of uh, uh, people, be it homeowners or tenants. Uh, uh, that's our approach. And uh, when we talk about residential energy, and if you can just stop in this slide uh, here for a while, it's um, obviously I said 70 countries, but in Central and Eastern Europe, it's about... Uh, we have uh, our area offices are uh, nicely presented in Bratislava, and then we have six national offices in six different Central Eastern European countries or countries of the former uh, socialist bloc, some of them new member states since 2004 or seven, some not yet. But they all are characterized by several features which are uh, which are in common. And that is that, a lot of the housing stock consists of multi-apartment buildings. Uh, those buildings were built in the communist era or socialist era, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, when uh, uh, ownership, maintenance, and uh, energy features were, uh, were of secondary uh, uh, importance or relevance. Therefore, they don't have it. Uh, and... Uh, <clears throat> Thirdly, they are part, a large percentage of the housing stock. In some countries, they are a third of the housing stock. In some countries, they are two thirds of the housing stock. Uh, what they have in common is that a large percentage, between 80 and 95% of the housing stock was privatized sometime, if you can go to the next, slide sometime in the beginning of 90s with the uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, anywhere between 80 and 95% of, of uh, the stock was uh, privatized for next to nothing for the for the tenant. So you have quite a bit of an owner occupied, high percentage of owner occupied stock. Uh, uh, lack of public housing for the most part, with very, very, very small exceptions in specific countries. And then uh, a, a transformation of the maintenance and management systems, which happened without really proper policy or uh, uh, market driven intervention in it. So, if you can go to the map on the next slide, that gives you a little bit. Uh, 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 an idea of where we uh, uh, base our operation in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, but they all have, and that's obviously the right side of the uh, of the slide. We 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 we've been basically trying to address uh, uh, multiple challenges, some of which were mentioned in the in the presentations before, of creating a sustainable model of renovating. Uh, the housing stock, the multi-apartment building stock uh, is, um, as I said, the least renovated in European Union. If you look by all parameters, and I'm not going to use statistics here because there are too many countries, but that's, that's, that is the case. And uh, <clears throat> what we do is uh, we basically try to <clears throat> create a, an approach in which we engage various aspects of the ecosystem. Uh, here we have an issue of housing adequacy. So um, energy poverty makes uh, uh, housing inadequate, inability to, to heat uh, uh, 
uh, your apartment, but also to use it for other purposes, the energy uh, does, does make it uh, uh, inappropriate, indecent, and uh, less than uh, adequate housing. But it comes as a matter of uh, multiple reasons, one of which is lack of housing policy, uh, from from the states, I mean, that was completely uh, transferred to the market, but then the market also fails at creating the right uh, products. Thirdly, because these owners are also uh, uh, poor uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, you have quite a lot of um, uh, social mixed living in the same multi-apartment buildings. As a result, uh, we have... Um, <clears throat> we have basically a large percentage of population living in inadequately heated uh, apartments and ones that have deferred maintenance and management for almost a generation. We're talking here about uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, what we, if you can, if you can circulate the slide from, from now on, Anna, I mean, like without stopping it. Uh, what we have here is basically a, a host of uh, projects and activities which start pretty much about 15 years ago in which we engage various parts of the ecosystem. Uh, but we start with the homeowners and homeowner associations. So at the center of our intervention is the homeowner association. We try to uh, engage them in creating consensus, understanding the challenges of renovating a building and then uh, reaching out to cities and local authorities policy and decision makers, uh, banks and financial institutions, uh, uh, building management and man maintenance companies, etc. So we work with a demand side, as was said in one of the presentations earlier, to decrease demand. But then we also engage uh, uh, the all the imperfections in the ecosystem. And in this slide, you have basically the, uh, the, the, the entirety of the ecosystem. A lot of gaps and a lot of failures, generically speaking, happen uh, in various parts of the, uh, of the ecosystem. Uh, how we address this? We, we are not a think tank necessarily only, nor a policy-driven organization only, but we like to use evidence. So what we do is we, we show that certain things are possible and we use those things in order to advocate further for improvements in, in policy and regulatory framework, but also to create more uh, financial mechanisms and uh, uh, approaches. So we do what is called proof of concept or demonstration buildings in a variety of countries and all of them very different, like Hungary, Bulgaria, Lithuania, North Macedonia, uh, Ukraine, etc. Et Purpose of this is that um, actually we use demonstration projects as advocacy tool and as a policy change tool, but also as a, um, a mechanism of raising more demand. Uh, energy efficiency is obviously the way to reduce energy uh, poverty, but it's not a popular concept. It's not what the average citizen dreams of or talks about. Uh, and our our uh, intention and our policy approach is to make it viable and understandable. Uh, so, so basically we try to establish that link between energy poverty, the fact that they cannot heat their apartment properly, uh, or that they pay more than 40% of their disposable income in February just for heating, to the fact that you know it will bring the types of benefits that were that were discussed by the previous uh, uh, speakers here. So better health, better educational outcomes, uh, better protection, better safety, better economic uh, uh, circumstances. Um, yeah. So anyway, I mean, in con 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 conclusion of of this, you would see. And I, I think some of them you're seeing, you're seeing some slides from projects where we've actually renovated buildings uh, throughout the years. And then we've brought that to the policymaker and sometimes to the market. You will see also some slides in which we actually uh, engage homeowners, but other slides in which we, we do financial planning, financial modeling, 
uh, we bring a combination of uh, different policy stakeholders, etc. Uh, I know there is only seven or eight minutes uh, until this, so, so I'll, I'll give the floor back to Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Basim. And sorry for if there had been a technical mistake with the presentation at the beginning. Um, it's really impressive, the work that you are doing, and it's really um, highly necessary in Central Eastern Europe. I also grew up in a multi-apartment building, and I still have a small apartment in one, and I know how difficult it is to reach um, ambition in <laughs> co-owners to um, renovate the dwellings and so thank you for um, moving forward this really important case and uh, now I would give the floor for the questions from um, from the um, from the audience um but before that maybe i just i would like to summarize in a few sentences that um at feanta we are working for um housing solutions for the most vulnerable to lift out people from uh, homelessness and to prevent homelessness and that's why we are really focusing on unfit housing and we advocate for renovating these homes in order to provide um, decent housing conditions for everyone and i would like to really thank for all the contributors to highlighting how um, serious is this issues related to unfit housing and how um, with different measures we can um, fight against these difficulties. So the first question goes to uh, Christina about um, how to phase out um, fossil fuel heating um, in the light of the energy performance of building directives and what is uh, their opinion on uh, hydrogen and biogas uh, which um, which are topics pushed by the fossil fuel industry as a replacement of heating oil and gas and i would be really interested in your answer um, there is another question about heat pumps which are often cited as a clean a solution for um, uh, to replace polluting heating mechanisms, but often they are also criticized as not being affordable for vulnerable households as in order to make them function efficiently, a really costly uh, complex renovation might be necessary in low performing dwellings. So maybe we can integrate these two questions and see if you have answers for that in a few minutes. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the questions. Um, I'll try to be quick, but not speak very fast. Um, so uh, thank you uh, for adding this piece of the puzzle. Uh, the energy performance of buildings directive is really crucial for a structural change um, in society and phasing out fossil fuels is absolutely needed. Um, there were a lot of very good points in the um, um, draft report, report from the European Parliament Rapporteur on, on this legislative file that we hope will be carried over through the negotiations um, in terms of uh, no longer having subsidies for fossil fuels, in terms of phasing them out from new and existing buildings. Um, in terms of introducing indoor uh, environmental quality standards that might help address other aspects of uh, unfit housing as well. So this is really a, a key file as as was um, as the question was making um, this point as well. And um, for hydrogen, um, this is, there may be other industries where uh, hydrogen has a place to roll, uh, uh, sorry, where hydrogen has a role to play in, in decarbonizing those industries, but for heating, uh, we have other clean options. Um, and our study, I didn't mention it in my presentation, but we looked at emissions from hydrogen, uh, from um, hydrogen-fueled boilers, 
and we found there's no um, there's a lot of variation in the literature in terms of how much NOx emissions we would have. So that's already a problem. It, there's a lot of insecurity. And uh, the report also found that they are uh, these boilers, the, the green ones, the green hydrogen boilers would be comparable to oil boilers and dirtier than gas boilers. So if we are moving towards phasing those out, from a, a, an air quality perspective, there's really no reason to rely on hydrogen boilers. And then to go into the costs, uh, question and heat pumps, um, I think we need to consider costs a bit more broadly. So there's the upfront installation cost, but there's also the health costs that our study looked at, and there's the cost of running uh, the, the appliance and the renovation costs. And so, for example, if we take subsidies away from fossil fuels, there is a way to redirect those funds. Um, we need to look, and there's um, other reports that have looked at the cost of running these um, heating solutions and um, heat pumps have been proven to be, sorry, to be um, a quite more affordable um, in terms of, you know, looking nowadays at the costs of gas and everything. Um, so I really think I'm not an expert on the technology itself, but if we take a holistic look at the costs, um, these are, are um, more and the way to go and more of a solution of, and the health-based uh, solution. Thanks uh, for your answer. I believe that we should really push uh, decision makers in order to map uh, what are the best solutions from local levels to regional, national and EU level and to make decisions which are not based on industrial interests, but on the interests of local residents and the best solutions that are socially and economically and environmentally suitable as well. And by working on these issues from different perspectives, from health, social or technical perspectives, I think we do an important contribution to inform decision makers. So um, if there are no other questions from the part of the, um, of the participants, um, we are exactly at the closure time of this session. So I would really thank you all for joining our um, session and sharing your knowledge and your messages and also for the, uh, for the participants to listen and let's keep in touch. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out for the different speakers um, in, through their organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and bye. Have a nice afternoon and if you feel like you can join the last session of the Right to Energy Forum, the link has been shared in the chat. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye.